All right. All right, so the defeat of the northern kingdoms. Um, I'm just going to start reading this out of the NKG for right here, and we'll talk about this first. So it came to pass when Jabakin king of Hazor heard these things that he sent to Joab, king of Madon, to the king of Cimarron, to the king of Akshapath, uh, that he s- and to the kings uh, who were from the north in the mountains, in the plains south of Chinneroth, in the low land, and in the heights of Dor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and in the west, and the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite in the mountains, and the uh, Hivite below Hermon in the land of Mizpah. So they went out, they and all their armies with them, as many people as the sand that is on the seashore in the multitudes, a lot of people, uh, with very many horses and chariots. And when all the kings had met together, they came and camped together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. I got a map uh, there, so when y'all start hearing some of these uh, things, um, these names, you kind of give your kind of give you a look of where it, where we're at because there's so many of them. Um, so. Uh, and it came to pass when Jebekin, the king of Hizor, heard these things. All right, so after hearing of the Israelites' conquests um, of the kings of the south, uh, the northern kings came together uh, to defeat Israel. Um, they assembled huge armies uh, that re- kind of reflected the attitude like, hey, man, we've got, you know, it's now or never. You know, and they probably already heard that, hey, these guys, they had to have heard that, uh, you know, that, hey, we're going to take back the land. Um, so they were like, hey, we got to stop these guys. So uh, there was uh, 300,000 soldiers, um, 10,000 horses, and 20,000 chariots. Um, those were the, the numbers that I found. And um, so, you know, a chariot, you know, the, the Israelites, uh, you know, when they left the land of Egypt, we know that Egypt had horses and chariots. Um, but, you know, the Israelites didn't, I'm sure, you know, the Egyptians would have given them whatever they wanted. But God didn't ask, God didn't request them, you know, to say, hey, well, let's get horses and chariots. Man, life would be a whole lot easier. That's what we would say, you know, obviously. But that's not what, you know, God uh, didn't intend on them using the horses or the chariots. They're going to have to depend on him and not the horses and the chariots. So it's kind of the same thing here. Um, uh, basically, a chariot to de- back then is like a modern day tank. I mean, so you can imagine, like I kind of was thinking about, it, and I was like, like Afghanistan today. You know, they're running around with AK-47s, riding donkeys, and we roll up with uh, Black Hawk helicopters and Moab, mother of all bombs, and Abram tanks and Humvees, and they're like, whoa, you know. But to their credit, you know, they took on the Soviet Union and they're still there. Now, we all know if we really wanted to get busy, you know, we could do it. Um, and I'll, you know, come back up to that. Uh, you know, ironically, today was D-Day, but, uh, you know, in Hiroshima, um, you know, if you look at, if you start thinking about the kind of people uh, here um, that um, Jacob's fixing to take care of, I mean, that's more people than we killed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I mean, when you think about the amount of people, and that's just the 300,000, it says there's 300,000 so, foot soldiers, 10,000 horses, and 20,000 chariots, and that's not including everybody else in the cities. Um, so I, I tried to find a number. I, I, I never found one. I don't know, what is it? 500,000, 600,000 people? It could be more than that, that he literally killed in this time of war. I mean, that is a bunch. I think there was 100 million people killed in World War. Uh, it was World War II, I believe, somewhere around in there. Um, but uh, still, it was amazing. Um, so all this prompted by what the kings had heard regarding Israel's success and victory. Um, and one of the things is, you know, when we're as Christians and we're believers, when we're walking in victory... Um, you know, we become targets. So, you know, the, uh, you know, the enemy kind of sees us 
uh, as we know, you know, sometimes when we're walking on, on that mountain and, yeah, baby. And then all of a sudden the enemy's like, hey, man, I got to stop what's going on here. And then the enemy comes against you. Um, so his enemies, uh, Israel's enemies, are fixing to come against it. You know, they've had great success up to this point. Um, you know, two things indicate uh, that now Israel is facing challenges that they never faced before. First is the size of the enemy army. Um, you know, as many people as the sand that is on the seashore uh, in multitude. And second is the technological superiority of the Canaanites with their horses and their chariots that um, the Israelites didn't have. The Israelites carried, and basically the Romans copied it. You know, and the Romans conquered. We know, you know how much of the world the Romans conquered, but it was a, a sword. Um, well, I would call it a knife, a big knife, but it was 10 to 18 inches long. And then they had uh, their uh, slingshot, you know, with uh, steel balls, and they had uh, bows and arrows and javelin um, and uh, spears. But, I mean, that, that's what they had. Um, and it said that the, the only thing to defeat, what I was reading was in uh, the, I uh, guess, Mesopotamians had uh, created the uh, flalix, you know, where all the shields, and then they said that the Roman, that the... Uh, that, that, but that like nothing could defeat it, but that short sword was the only thing that could de defeat the Flalix. Um, so, and like Steve said before, I mean, when your knife's that long, if that's what you got, or their sword was that long, I mean, it's, it's up close and personal. Um, but that's what they had. Um, so the challenge is brought to Israel seemed to increase at each step from Jericho to Ai to the battle with the southern kings. Um, now it's this battle, so we know that the first one, hey man, you know, God took care of that. And then the second one, they had to physically get involved, and then they got involved again, and now, you know, now they're looking at, you can imagine, you know, as many as the, as many sands, so you can imagine the horses and the chariots, and you know, if they saw all this, they were like, just, oh man. So we get into this next verse um, where God speaks to Joshua. Um, so, but the Lord said to Joshua, Don't be afraid of them, for tomorrow, about this time, I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. You shall hamstring the horses and burn the chariots with fire. Uh, hamstringing the horses, um, basically, you're killing the horse. They said it was a humane way to kill the horse, but that's what they were doing. So they were, you know, the Lord said, hey, you burn all the chariots and you basically kill all the horses because you're not taking them back. And if they had them, then people would say, oh, man, look, you know, they had all those chariots and horses. No wonder they beat us. Well, no, that's not, you know, they'll know, as these other people know, it was God. Hey, man, your God is a powerful God. And they know that, you know, that, and that's the way God, you know, even in our lives, you know, we're supposed to glorify God uh, in the things that we do. And um, so God's fixing to get glorified in this battle. And, and Joshua was uh, listening to the Lord, but Joshua always also needs encouragement. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the life lessons here is, you know, we often find that challenges facing us in our Christian life increases at each step. Uh, good use, uses, God uses each previous victory as a springboard for what we face in the future. Um, and tomorrow, about this time, I will deliver all of them up slain uh, before Israel. Uh, this attack was new and more severe than the previous challenges. Um, Joshua needed a fresh confirmation of God's promise for his life, and the Lord was faithful uh, to bring it. Um, and, you know, lots of times, you know, we need to be the same thing as brothers in Christ and be encouraging to each other. Um, you know, we need encouragement. Um, and, and then there's some people uh, here that are prophets, and they'll come give you a word of, you know, hey, a word of encouragement. Hey, the Lord, you know, told me that, you know, uh, you know, you need to do this, or the Lord one spoke to me and, you know, said this. Um, and uh, it's best to hear from the Lord directly. Um, that's the best thing to hear. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes 
uh, we don't. And other people will have to come and encourage us and, and, and uh, hear what, you know, we need to hear what the Lord has to say. You know, it's like in John um, 10, 27, you know, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, they follow me. Um, and it's important to hear God's voice. And sometimes we walk in those seasons where we're really hearing God's voice, and sometimes we're in those seasons where we don't, you know, but it's that uh, season, um, you know, when we're hearing from the Lord and, and listening and doing what He commands us to do, uh, like Joshua, uh, that uh, He can do incredible things uh, through our actions. Um, you know, just like witnessing, sometimes we may get discouraged. Um, that's one of the you know most important things that we can do is witness. You know, go out and make disciples. And you know, sometimes we can get, and I know we're all guilty, um, but sometimes we can get discouraged. A person you know may turn us down or whatever. Or we get down, but uh, you know that's uh, one of the most important things that we can do um, is to witness. Um, all right, so, so Joshua and all the people of war with him came against them suddenly by the waters of Mermon, and they attacked them. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who defeated them and chased them to greater Sidon, to the brook of Mis Misrepoth, and to the valley of Mizpah eastward. They attacked them until they left none of them remaining. So Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him. He hamstrung their horses and bur burned their chariots with fire. All right, so Joshua and all the people of war came with him against them suddenly. So Joshua fought with boldness and strategy. He surprised them uh, with an unexpected ambush. And then that reminded me, you know, history repeats itself. You know, people are stupid. You know, because we can go to the book of Revelations and we can say, yeah, you know, it's going to happen again. But God had hardened their heart. And God is going to harden everybody in the Middle East heart again, in the kings of the north, and they're going to they're come against Israel again one day. And God's going to win again. Um, but we can look at the 1967 war, which the Israelites you know, should not have won. People still study that war and are just amazed at how the Israelites won the war of 1967. I'm just going to read uh, just a surprise attack. So it was almost like, you know, I'm sure most military commanders study history. So, I, you know, as I'm sitting there looking at this, and as um, you had uh, uh, Egypt, Syria, Iran, Jordan, and I believe the, um, the Emirates uh, came against Israel. They were say, hey, you know, this was a mistake. You shouldn't ever give Israel back the land. We're going to take it. And um, so this is the, so you, you have to be wondering about the commander. He studied history. And now when we read through this, you got to wonder that, hey, you know, was he thinking about Joshua? And it's like, wait a minute, Joshua did a surprise attack. Why don't we do a surprise attack? So it's by June 5th, the outbreak of hostility seemed inevitable. Five Egyptian divisions of ground troops and two divisions of armored of armor occupied the Sinai, ready to roll into Israel. Hundreds of tanks stood ready, opposite of Elat, prepared to topple uh, Negev. The Jordanian army had placed thousands of soldiers and hundreds of tanks in the West Bank and along Israel's eastern border. Reinforcements from Iraq stood ready. On the northern border, Syrian soldiers on the Golan Heights dug in for a long fight. The numbers I saw was there was 400,000 Arabs against 200 and some thousand, uh, 275 or something like that, Israeli. So double the, the amount of soldiers. Um, before the Arab nations could strike, Israel launched preemptive airstrikes against Egyptian airfields. As the Israeli Air Force took to the sky, the first miracle of the war occurred. Jordanian radar detected the planes and tried to warn Egypt, but the Egyptians had changed their coding frequencies the previous day and had not yet updated the Jordanians with the new codes. The message never went through, giving Israel this element of surprise. The Egyptians had no time to react. The Israeli Air Force deployed, destroyed six Egyptian airfields and hundreds of Egyptian planes in a single day. 
Israel destroyed the Egyptian and Syrian air forces. The Egyptian air force uh, never even had a chance to leave the ground. They advanced so rapidly that, again, the Egyptian forces scarcely had time to react. That same day, the Israelis launched a ground offensive into the Gaza Strip and the Sinai, catching Egyptian troops completely surprised. Israeli tanks and ground forces rolled into the heavily defended Sinai and quickly punched a hole through the lines. They advanced so rapidly that, again, the Egyptian forces scarcely had time to react. A speed of Israel advanced, placed at least one Israeli tank crew in a vulnerable position. They found themselves lost in the Sinai and surrounded by Egyptian posts. The tank commander prayed, Hashem, you led our ancestors through the wilderness with a pillar of fire. Please show us, please show us the path on which you led our fathers out from this place. Incredibly, the crew spotted a ridgeway as if illuminated from above that led them through the rugged territory away from the enemy post and back to safety. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so, I mean, God's, God was doing it long before that. So I may have let's see. So Joshua did to them as the Lord had told. Joshua fought with obedience, doing exactly what the Lord told him to do, even destroying the Canaanite weapons, the horses and the chariots, instead of taking them for his own army. Um, Joshua fought with passion and commitment. He did not let up until he had accomplished as much as he could. They attacked him until they left none of them remaining. Joshua turned back at that time and took Hazor and struck its king with a sword. For Hazor was formerly the head of the, all those kingdoms, and they struck all the people who were in it with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was none left breathing. Then he burned Hazor with fire. So all the cities of those kings and all their kings took Joshua and struck with the edge of the sword. He utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. But as for the cities that stood on their mounds, Israel burned none of them except Hazor only, which Joshua burned, and all the spoils of these cities and their livestock. The children of Israel took as booty for themselves, but they struck every man with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, and they had nothing left breathing and left none of them breathing as the Lord had commanded Moses his servant. So Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. Um, they found uh, Hazor ashes um, on a emana, emanama, a tablet um, written to Pharaoh in uh, 1300. In 80 BC, uh, by Egyptian envoy to North Palestine, and said, "My lord, the king, uh, recall what uh, Hazor and its king have already had to endure." So that was um, on this tablet they found uh, that they had already that it was talking about what uh, the Egyptian, I mean, what the Israelites had done to Hazor. Um, but if you'll turn to uh, Deuteronomy 6:10, and uh, Anybody wants to read that? And this shall be what the Lord thy God has brought to you into the land which you swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not in the world. You said 610, right? Yeah, 610. Yep. All right, so we see there that they're talking about that they're going to enter, that they're going to. Uh, I don't have it right in front of me, but they're, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, all right, so that's why, why didn't they burn them? They burn, you know, um, They burned one, but they didn't burn, they burned Hazor with fire, but uh, they didn't burn the other ones because they were going to you know, occupy those, like it, was, like it said in Deuteronomy uh, 6.10, um, and took the spoils. So 
See, they struck all the people who were in it with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was none left breathing. Uh, the staggering completeness of destruction, especially in human terms, shows us the completeness of God's judgment. Um, Israel's obedience and the depravity of the Canaanites. So when we had talked about this before, you know, about what to say to people, um, you know, if they ever had that, you know, we had that debate that night, um, you know, well, oh my gosh, you know, well, you know, God just, you know, how can he be a God of love if he destroyed all these people? Um, you know, and we talked about, you know, what to say or what not to say. Um, but, uh, you know, it's God's, God's judgment is true. You know, I mean, God, you know, cannot sin and he detests sin. So he's going to punish sin. I mean, and that's just the way it is. 